Welcome to the Evidence-Based Strategies Series, Guiding the Targeted Improvement Plan Process. My name is Tessa, and I am the Nebraska MTSS Regional Lead for Region 5. And I am Scott, and I am the Nebraska MTSS Regional Lead for Region 1. The Nebraska Multi-Tiered System of Support Team, in collaboration with the Nebraska Department of Education's Office of Special Education, has created a series of webinars to guide the implementation of the evidence-based strategies identified in the targeted improvement plan. Since we know that students who are identified as needing special education support deserve to be in the general education classrooms first and foremost, these webinars should be used to support district and school-wide continuous improvement efforts. As part of the series, there are four crash course webinars that will focus on each of the evidence-based strategies. One staff rollout webinar, four classroom implementation webinars, and a data-based decision-making webinar. The purpose of this webinar series is to enhance the implementation of evidence-based strategies with a focus on tier one core support within an MTSS framework and is applicable to all classrooms within a district. So welcome to the crash course on positive constructive feedback as part one of the series. Throughout this webinar, we will recognize how the targeted improvement plan or TIP is part of a multi-tiered system of support, MTSS framework. We'll define positive constructive feedback as an evidence-based practice at the tier one core level. We will explore the major elements of positive constructive feedback within the scope of content, design of instruction, delivery of instruction, and practice for effective implementation. We will also identify examples for tier one core instruction at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. So first, let's identify how the TIP fits into an MTSS framework. In 2014, the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education Programs revised its accountability system to shift the balance from a system focused primarily on compliance to one that puts more emphasis on results. This new accountability framework for special education is intended to improve learning for students with disabilities. Each state is required to, de to develop a state systemic improvement plan to identify gaps in student performance, analyze state systems, and then implement targeted evidence-based reforms to address the gaps. In 2015, NDE's Office of Special Education with stakeholder input identified MTSS as a sound, logical, and coherent strategy that is aligned with the state-identified measurable result. Nebraska then developed a new multi-tiered system of support framework in 2016 that was intended to be a systematic and integrated approach to continuous improvement and an evidence-based model of providing instruction and intervention supports to all students based on academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs identified through data. This framework is known as Nebraska MTSS, which integrates PBIS into the RTI model, 
and also includes early childhood pyramid and social emotional behavioral learning. Then in 2019, NDE's Office of Special Education established the focus of the state systemic improvement plan to, to increase the use of evidence-based practices across the state by providing support for district targeted improvement plans, including data analysis, selection of evidence-based practices, and implementation of evidence-based practices to fidelity. The goal of the targeted improvement plan is to improve learning and educational outcomes for students with disabilities. Data shows that the majority of students with disabilities in the state of Nebraska spend the bulk of their day in the general education classroom. Because of that, the selected evidence-based strategy is intended to be used at the tier one core level in the general education classrooms. Research tells us that the best way to improve outcomes for students with disabilities is by improving education for all students. So in order to ensure each student has access to evidence-based practices as required by the targeted improvement plan, we need to build structures and systems that allow for inclusive practices to ensure each student has access to core practices. There is clear and consistent evidence that inclusive educational settings can confer substantial short and long-term benefits for students with and without disabilities. What we know is this can occur through a well-developed MTSS framework. So as we consider implementing a multi-tiered system of support, we have to first recognize that MTSS is the system that we use to organize the practices that we, as the adults, provide to all students. This includes first ensuring that we are using high quality instructional materials and effective instruction in all of our classrooms. We also use data so that we can then identify students that are in need of additional support early on in the process. This requires all educators and stakeholders to engage in a problem solving process to determine the appropriate academic, social, emotional, and behavioral support for each learner. So remember, when we're talking about MTSS, MTSS is how we organize the supports that we provide for students. We identify the supports through a layered continuum that recognizes what do we do for all students, what do we have in place for some, and what do we do for, uh, for a few students. We know that by putting our focus and our efforts in establishing really strong tier one supports through that effective instruction and high quality instructional materials, the majority of our students will be successful. Then once we are implementing our tier one practices effectively, it becomes a lot easier for us to accurately identify those students that are in need of further assistance. So as we look at those tier one core efforts, we have to continue to evaluate and strengthen our key foundational components that we know support all students in a safe, welcoming and predictable environment. Through preventative and proactive approaches, we can provide social, emotional, behavioral, and academic support for all students while building positive relationships. Through processes such as the targeted improvement plan, we can embed an evidence-based strategy and focus on the fidelity of implementing that evidence-based practice, such as providing positive constructive feedback 
through that supportive environment. Now that we have an understanding of the targeted improvement plan, let's move on to defining positive constructive feedback as an evidence-based practice at the tier one core level. We will start by grounding ourselves in a common definition of feedback in general. So feedback is information that is provided with the goal of improving performance, whether that be academically, socially, emotionally, and or behaviorally. And when this feedback is done effectively, it can reduce the gap between students' current knowledge and understanding and what they need or have yet to know and understand. So more specifically, positive and constructive feedback is respectful and positive, which includes being genuine and age appropriate. It's feedback that's delivered immediately after a student response. The feedback fits within the instruction or the phase of learning, and it fits with the expectation of students. So that feedback is meaningful and it truly connects to their learning. Positive and constructive feedback, it's clear, it's brief, uh, it's given after specific actions, which is goal-directed, so students understand why they are receiving that feedback. And knowing that the feedback can be delivered in different modalities, it can be oral, written, or even nonverbal, depending on the situation. So we may ask, why does positive construction feedback matter? Well, it has a lot of positive benefits. It increases student motivation and effort. It boosts their confidence. It helps students understand and develop their skills so they feel valued. And those are all attributes of a successful and positive school experience, which really results in creating lifelong learners. So we'd like you to uh, take some time uh, as a team We'd like you to push pause on this webinar to have uh, a, a conversation about what the definition of positive constructive feedback your district has agreed on. There are many definitions of positive constructive feedback. The most important thing is that your district has decided and committed to one definition to provide clarity and consistency. So in your conversation, if you realize that no definition exists, take some time to create one that you all agree on. And then think about how will you ensure all stakeholders know and understand the definition? And then how do you or will you be sure this evidence-based strategy is implemented with fidelity? Now let's explore the four major elements of positive constructive feedback. The four major elements of positive constructive feedback, which is taken from high leverage practices that we will explore are goal-directed, constructive, immediate, and respectful and positive. We all have good intentions when we are working with our students. As we go through each element, be thinking about your own experiences or maybe observations that you've made of other adults when they are providing feedback to students. Maybe you can think of a time where you wish you would have been able to provide more constructive feedback. When we as adults, can truly reflect on our practices and become aware, 
it's crucial to be sure that we can provide feedback that helps students improve their own performance academically, uh, social, emotionally, or behaviorally, so that when we know better, we can do better. One element to consider when implementing positive constructive feedback is that the feedback is goal-directed. In order for feedback to be goal-directed, it needs to be specific so the student clearly understands how to improve how to improve their performance to reach their goal. This has a goal-directed example and a non-example. As I read the goal-directed example, ask yourself, would the student have clarity on what they specifically did well at and a way to improve? I noticed that you did your belly breathing when your partner made you mad. That's a great way to use your self-management skills to keep yourself calm. Now, how can you have a calm and positive conversation with your partner to let them know what bothered you? You can tell the student understands that they're talking about belly breathing specifically and that that is a great self-management skill. And then in addition, it's asking the student to start thinking uh, about how they can have a calm and positive conversation for the next step, which is goal-directed, versus the non-example. You've done great so far. Just keep going until the partner work time is over. The goal-directed non-example is not specific or goal-directed. It does not provide the student with clarity on how close they are to achieving the goal, or what they are specifically doing well at. Again, we'd like you to use this time for some reflection so you can pause the webinar. And we'd like you to talk as a team and think about what is the value of providing goal-directed feedback. And then start thinking and brainstorm three to five ways that you can intentionally provide goal-directed feedback in academic, social, emotional, and behavioral scenarios when working with students. The next element of positive constructive feedback we will explore is constructive. In order for students to know how to identify their specific areas of growth and determine next steps to fix it, feedback needs to be constructive. Constructive feedback provides support as they progress towards mastery of a new skill, and it provides the student with specific steps to take in response to the feedback. In other words, it provides clarity. So again, we have an example and a non-example. As I read the constructive example, Think about how that feedback provides support and specific st steps the student can take. You're on the right track with question number three, but there is a small error. Look back at your sample problems and see if you can find where you made a calculation error with a negative number. In that scenario, it points out the specific problem, number three, and that there is a calculation error with a negative number. There's clarity for the student. The non-example, question three is incorrect. Try it again and just try harder this time. That example does not provide any specific guidance or direction, which leaves the student with just as many, if not more questions than when they started. So again, another time for reflection for you to pause the webinar 
And we'd like you to reflect on the value of providing constructive feedback. And again, start thinking about specific ways to provide constructive feedback in academic, social, emotional, and behavioral scenarios when working with students. The next element of effective feedback uh, that we will be discussing is that the feedback we provide to students needs to be immediate. So ideally, when we're providing feedback to students, it should be provided as soon as soon after a student has performed a task or displayed a behavior. This allows the student to make an immediate uh, needed changes, and it also keeps them from uh, practicing incorrect actions. It also helps the student know specifically what they did and why they're receiving the feedback as they continue to work toward a specific goal. So providing our feedback immediately is essentially important um, when students are learning a new skill. Uh, we use that feedback as teachers to address any misconceptions about the new content and allows uh, students to kind of see how to apply the newly learned skills in the appropriate context. So as students are learning new skills, the more feedback we can provide and the more immediate feedback we can provide is really going to help them kind of build those understanding, that understanding of those skills and be able to apply those skills later. So let's look at a couple of examples or an example and a non-example. So consider this. Uh, class has started and Steve does not have his needed materials for class. The teacher might state, hey, Steve, I notice you don't have your uh, materials. And remember, our classroom expectation is to be responsible and ready for class every day. To be responsible in this class, you need to bring your notebook and pen. So let me help you come up with a new strategy for ensuring you are ready for class tomorrow. So notice in this example, the teacher provided feedback to the student regarding the classroom expectation of being responsible quickly after realizing that the student, uh, Steve, didn't have the needed materials. By doing so, this is increases the likelihood that Steve's going to have the needed materials the following day. The teacher even went a step further and said, hey, let's come up with a new strategy uh, really to support bringing those classroom materials the next day. So that immediate feedback was able to catch Steve noticing that they didn't have the uh, materials and provide that feedback right away. Now compare that to our non-example. Um, say, allowing a student to continuously mispronounce a new vocabulary term during oral reading. So in this scenario, if we're allowing the error to continue, uh, that student is rehearsing the incorrect pronunciation and probably thought or determined they were correct since the teacher didn't say anything or intervene. So think about how, if we provided immediate feedback in this situ uh, situation, how would that affect the student's correct uh, use of the pronunciation? So here's another opportunity for your reflection. Uh, give yourself some time to pause the recording of this webinar to reflect independently or with your team. What do you see as the value of providing immediate feedback to students? Uh, possibly consider brainstorming three to five ways to provide immediate feedback in different academic, social, emotional, and behavioral scenarios uh, when working with students. So pause the webinar and reflect with your team. Our last element of constructive feedback that we must consider is that our feedback has to be respectful and positive. So feedback that is respectful and positive, really it focuses on student successes and their progress towards a goal rather than on their deficits. When we're really focused and, and have the mindset of providing respectful and positive feedback, it helps us as educators to keep the focus on students' actions uh, rather than maybe making personal judgments. So really thinking about how can we make sure that we're providing positive feedback as much as possible. 
So why, why do we want to make sure that we focus on positive feedback? Again, the goal here is that we're addressing any misconceptions about new content and we're allowing to apply, uh, allowing students to apply new skills and really thinking about it from a positive feedback standpoint what we're doing is we're reinforcing that teaching of new skills and behaviors and we know the behavior uh both academic behavior or what have you whatever you're thinking of uh that behavior is more likely to become a habit and recur in the future uh, especially if it's demonstrated as being beneficial, like if we're giving a reason why this is important. Uh, by being and focusing on positive feedback, we're harnessing uh, the influence of kids who are showing expected behaviors to hopefully encourage the kids who maybe aren't. Um, we're also strengthening positive behaviors that can actually compete with a problem behavior because the student recognizes that feedback that they get from their teacher uh, for doing things the right way. And then overall, just using and utilizing positive feedback helps us improve and promote a positive school and classroom climate and allows us to create those positive interactions and strengthen our relationships and rapport with students. So while we know that focusing on providing specific positive feedback is going to increase the likelihood that the behavior we want to see will happen again, this does not mean that educators should not use corrective feedback when students make academic or behavioral errors. Uh, feedback that is corrective but still goal-directed will help students address those errors or any misconceptions that they may have. So we absolutely need to use corrective feedback when we see those errors happening. But as we balance our use of positive to corrective feedback, our goal should be to utilize positive feedback more than corrective. In fact, research has shown that providing positive feedback at least four times more frequently than corrective feedback helps us establish that predictable and positive environment where appropriate behavior receives much more attention than inappropriate behavior. So we know that corrective feedback is absolutely necessary, but the key is the ratio. Research has shown us that we increase appropriate behavior by 80% just by pointing out what someone is doing correctly. So let's look at an example of positive feedback and an example of corrective feedback. So think about this example. When I said it was time to begin, you cleared off your desk, you got your materials out, and you began uh, working quickly. Thank you for being responsible. So notice how in this scenario, the teacher was very specific with the actions that the student did. They focus on those specifically correct actions that the uh, student was doing, clearing off their desk, getting their materials out, and beginning to work quickly. And then they tied their build, their feedback to the building-wide expectation of being responsible. So now let's look at an example of corrective feedback. Here this, uh, the teacher mentions, when I said it was time to begin, you were kind of distracted and I had to remind you to start working two times. Tomorrow, I really want you to see you being responsible and getting your uh, started on your assignment right away. Doing that will help you get done faster. So in the corrective feedback example, notice that the teacher was, again, specific in the behavioral errors that the student made, and they provided what the goal should be, talking about how they want them to be responsible and getting started on their assignment right away. They even went a step further and provided the rationale for showing the appropriate behavior to give students that understanding of when showing that appropriate behavior most likely I'm going to get, get something that I want, in this case, getting the assignment done faster. So we come to our next uh, reflection time. So again, pause the recording of this webinar to reflect independently or with your team. What is the value of providing positive feedback? Uh, again, think about maybe brainstorming three to five ways to provide positive feedback in an academic or social, emotional, or behavioral scenario that you've had when working with students. Take a minute to record, uh, to pause the recording and reflect either individually or with your team.
<laughs> so we've gone through our elements of positive constructive feedback. Um, as we've only had a short time together, we did not uh, show specific examples of those uh, elements of feedback. However, we have showed or provided a video uh, that shows examples of goal-oriented, constructive, immediate, and positive feedback. Uh, one possible next step for your team would be to view those examples and reflect on the strategies that you saw. So here's the video where you'll find examples of the positive and constructive feedback. You can either click on the link uh, in the slides or use the QR code to access the video. It's a, the video is available whenever your team is ready to take the next steps with providing effective feedback. So as we come to the conclusion of our time together, let's take some time to review uh, kind of the information that we presented throughout this webinar. So within this webinar, we recognized how the school improvement efforts that you have identified through the targeted improvement plan or TIP are integrated in the actions that we use in our multi-tiered system of support or MTSS framework. We identified and defined positive constructive feedback as an evidence-based practice used at the tier one core level for all students. We explored the major elements of positive constructive feedback and uh, that feedback should be goal-directed, goal uh, constructive, immediate, and respectful and, and positive. And we identified examples of academic, social, emotional, and behavioral feedback at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. So for the last time, we want to give you a second before ending this recording to take one more moment to pause the recording of this webinar and reflect independently as a, as a team, or excuse me, independently or with your team. What will be your next steps to strengthen the use of positive constructive feedback at your school or district as you continue this emphasis on positive corrective feedback throughout the targeted improvement plan? What needs to be communicated to all educators in your school or district? Who will be the who will communicate those expectations and by when? So as you finish this webinar, think about some specific, concrete next steps that you and your team can can accomplish. So as we conclude, we want to thank you for taking the time to learn more about specific uh, positive constructive feedback. As a reminder, this is just one webinar as a part of a series. If you would like to learn more about the other three evidence-based strategies identified in the targeted improvement plan, you can view a crash course webinar for each of these three. If you would like to learn more about starting the implementation of any of the four evidence-based strategies, we have a webinar titled Staff Rollout to assist in those efforts. Once you have had the opportunity to strategically roll out the evidence-based strategy that you've identified through your tip, there are webinars titled Classroom Implementation that will assist in guiding implementation for each strategy. Lastly, after classroom implementation is established, teams can view the final webinar in the series titled Data-Based Decision-Making to assist in the use of assessment and fidelity data in order to improve outcomes for all students. Lastly, we would like to remind you to please visit the Nebraska MTSS website at nemtss.unl.edu to view all of the webinars, as well as find the information needed to contact your regional support lead to address any questions you might have. Tessa and I want to thank you for joining us uh, on this webinar, and we hope you have a wonderful day.